Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first plenary session. The title of this plenary session is uh, Managing Diversity Multi-Level and Multi-Sectoral Collaboration. Uh, and we have been very lucky indeed in assembling uh, a very interesting panel which would reflect some of the thinking and framing that we had in relation to how we view the issue of governance diversity. I'm just trying to fix the sound quality. Um, before I uh, obviously start introducing our panelists, I wanted to uh, really share with you a few um, initial ideas in relation to how we view diversity and how we view the changing landscape. I think we, there's no denying the fact that the diversity that we are seeing in 2019 is absolutely more complex in terms of how it is articulated and how it manifests across different situations. We have coined a term in academia by referring to it as superdiversity, implying that it is more than simply the fixed binary uh, features of someone being from X culture or X country and living in a different culture or, or, or country. So it's much more uh, intricate. There's much more circula circularity. Uh, there are multiple sources of beliefs, uh, values, identities. People access different cultural systems and cultural repertoires, and they manage to navigate them in different ways. But what I want really to focus on initially is to remind all of us that the impetus for interculturality in general, and intercultural dialogue in particular, was really in the pioneering work of some early scholars, in particular uh, Pettigrew and Orport, and they worked on the intercultural contact hypothesis. But what we don't really think about enough is the intercultural contact hypothesis, which is the foundation of intercultural dialogue and also a foundation of governance, di governance of dialogue, has some key requisite conditions. And without those positive conditions, it is very difficult for intercultural dialogue to actually bear fruit in terms of ensuring social peace, in terms of ensuring inclusion, in terms of ensuring that everyone's dignity, human rights, and other claims, be they individual or group claims, are protected and, and being able to uh, be achieved. What is also very interesting and very important for us to remember is, and we've been having this discussion earlier, is intercultural dialogue is not simply about talking and listening. That is not intercultural dialogue. Intercultural dialogue essentially is a, a, an avenue, an outlet, through which we are able to challenge existing prejudices in society. We are able to disrupt existing notions and institutions of injustice and empowerment. So you need to work towards transformative positive change to be able to achieve meaningful, lasting, impactful intercultural dialogue in a way that allows you to govern diversity in, in, in ethical, democratic, and ultimately uh, impactful ways. And this brings me to why we're here, and this panel in particular. So we think that the responsibility for approaching governance diversity in that manner, that is, with the absolute attributes of being transformative, being inclusive, being democratic, and being ultimately uh, driven by the right conditions in society, we think to be able to be achieved, governance of diversity has to be two things. It has to be multi-sectoral, that is, involves different sectors in our societies, not only government. So government, civil society, academia, NGOs, uh, indigenous networks, it involves absolutely all of those sectors coming together and working together around diversity, which after all implicates all of them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it has to be also multi-level. And what we mean by multi-level is it's not simply a state-centered approach, that is driven by centralized policies, it must also be different levels of governance. So uh, federal, national, state, but in particular, and this is the key to interculturality, is locally, organically driven initiatives. So I think those two elements, the multi-level and multi-sectoral, the transformative and the existence of the right conditions, really is why we think 
having this particular discussion right now is very important, and we have very carefully selected the participants here so that we get those complementary uh, perspectives in relation to diversity. So the format of this panel is uh, we will uh, initially have some opening uh, observations uh, from Her Excellency Yvonne Baki, who will join us in, in, in a moment. Then we will go around the panel, and each panelist will initially have up to five minutes. I will stop them if they exceed five minutes. And in those five minutes, they will make an initial statement on this particular issue of multi-sectoral, or multi-level governance of diversity. After those initial five-minute statements, there will be an interactive discussion, and we hope that at the end of that interactive discussion, there will be time for questions from, from you, obviously, the, the audience, so that we can enrich the discussions even further. So with that introduction out of the way, let me now start by calling upon Her Excellency Yvonne Baki, who is the Ecuadorian diplomat and politician, and has been designated at UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador since February 2010. Uh, she's done so many amazing things, so I won't waste too much time on reading her very extensive bio, but I'll invite uh, Yvonne to join us and to open this panel by offering us her thoughts on this particular theme. So please join me in welcoming Her Excellency Yvonne Baki. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Excellencies, distinguished panel, ladies and gentlemen. I am really delighted to be speaking in this Fifth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue with a focus on action. I believe that a worldwide consensus is forming that excessive forms of discrimination, inequality, and violent conflict are unacceptable, and that a global approach is necessary to eradicate them. Therefore, now is the right time to shift our focus to action. The likelihood of success has never been better because we now live in a global village where physical distance is progressively becoming less of a barrier. I believe our action needs to address the three aspects of what makes us human beings, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. On the physical level, poverty is perhaps the most pressing issue. But when poverty is deconstructed, inequality and discrimination emerge as the primary drivers in the forms of unequal access to opportunities and economic benefits and discriminatory barriers based on gender, ethnicity, race, age, social status, and so on. In turn, it is well documented that societies with higher levels of inequality experience higher levels of social tensions and violence. Therefore, by addressing inequality, we will also be contributing to the reduction of discrimination and violence. In my experience, you cannot manage what we do not measure. I believe that the first step in addressing inequality as a global goal is to measure it in a subtle forms at the national and regional levels all across the world. Such forms include time spent on non-paid activities by women, income distribution levels by ethnicity, race, gender, minority groups, etc., school attendance by gender and income level, access to labor and goods markets, access to voting, and so on. From this exercise, a picture will emerge that will help national governments develop policies, set goals, and implement reforms to best address the, the areas where they lag behind. In parallel, the institutions that have come together in sponsoring this forum should develop tools and best practices that would assist national governments in measuring poverty, inequality, and discriminatory barriers, set policy goals, and implement reforms. On the mental level, the information revolution is creating communities that are no longer physically connected. One can say that they are mentally connected digital communities. Almost without feeling it, a significant part of our mental, emotional, and social lives has already shifted to the ever-present cloud. 
This is both a threat and an opportunity. It is a threat because the minds of our young can be filled with undesirable content. But it is to develop content for civic programs, documentaries, and online advertising content worldwide with the support of the major social media platforms. This is basic marketing. On the spiritual level, I believe we are spiritual beings who happens to be human beings. Every religion teaches that in our essence, we are all endowed with an immortal spirit or animated by a divine principle. And from that perspective, the outer layers of physical reality disappear. The distinctions of ethnicity, gender, and age fade. Religious factions that sow discord and hate and that promote violence and aggression can find in the texts of their religion pretexts to justify any message they want. The truth, however, is that all major religions are deeply spiritual and peaceful in their core. Today, Islam is maligned as being a religion of violence. Islamophobia is everywhere. The truth, however, is that Islam is a religion of peace. The word Islam itself means peace. The truth is that Islam is a profoundly tolerant religion that has centuries of peaceful coexistence with other religions as proof of that. In the Quran, God says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that ye may know each other, not that ye may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous of you. The golden rule is the principle of treating others as one would wish to be treated. It is the basis of morality. And if fully observed, we would have no rampant discrimination, inequality, and violence in our world. The golden rule is the fundamental moral principle in every world religion. In Hinduism, the Mahabharata states, this is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. In Buddhism, the Udhavana, Udhana Varga states, hurt no others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. In Doctrine of the Mean, Confucius is asked, is there one word that can serve as a principle of conduct of la for life, of conduct for life? He replied, it is the word shu, reciprocity. Do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus sums up his teachings, saying, Therefore, whatever you desire for men to do to you, you shall also do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The Jewish Talmud states, What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. This is the law. All the rest is commentary. In the Hadith, the Prophet Muhammad says, do unto all men as you would wish to have done unto you and reject for others what you would reject for yourself. None of you is truly a believer until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. So giving all the foregoing, why is it that there is so much inner religious strife in our world? I truly believe that it is a small fraction of people who subvert and twist religion to political and other ends. The antidote to this is intensified interfaith dialogue from the local to the global levels, from the brick and mortar schools to the virtual academy, and from the physical market square to the global village. In summary, I urge to translate the lofty goals of this forum into action by endowing the physical aspect of our humanity with the knowledge to upend 
inequality by cultivating our mental landscapes with the seeds of social responsibility, fairness, and justice, and by enriching our spirituality with the diversity of our faiths. Today, all this and more are possible because we live together in a small village on a shrinking globe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Yvonne Baki, for setting the scene for us. We now move to the uh, plenary, uh, sorry, to the individual presentations of our panelists, and I ask that all our panelists will uh, speak for five minutes, uh, making an opening statement, and then we will we'll get into some interactive discussion around some specific questions and themes that we would like to uh, explore with more depth and with more details. Uh, I would like to start with um, Ambassador Anna Karimov, uh, obviously our host here in Azerbaijan. Uh, Ambassador Karimov has been a very uh, big, uh, really, supporter of intercultural dialogue. He's been uh, the champion in Paris UNESCO of ICD as uh, ambassador for Azerbaijan since 2014. I know that he's multilingual. Uh, he's done uh, studies in international relations, but he's, I, I read now he's also doing his PhD. So all the uh, courage and encouragement uh, to you, Ambassador Karimov. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Karimov to the plenary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mansouri, for this introduction. First of all, I would like to express my uh, thanks and honor uh, to be a, among these distinguished panelists. It's an indeed honor, and I would like to thank the UNESCO for organizing this plenary session. Uh, the topic in need is very important nowadays. I mean, we are all uh, discussing the issue of diversity and why it is important, why we need this, whether it is essential for the societies, etc. So I would like to a bit dwell on those aspects. First of all, uh, what is the diversity in our understanding and why it is important. And of course, the model of Azerbaijan, which is also somehow can be a, can be example uh, of, of the multiculturalism and diversity. So, no doubt that the world rapidly globalizes and diversity is becoming increasingly present across all aspects of our life, encompassing gender, race, ethnicity, religion, or socioeconomic background, diversity and multicultural environment are important for a whole host of reasons, above all for the different perspectives they provide. Each day our society becomes more and more diverse. We meet more people daily and each one brings a new perspective about something into our lives. People everywhere have different opinions and ideas that we might never have thought about. Our lives are filled with the people, each with different backgrounds and experiences, who, whom we interact every day. The traditional concept of diversity has often focused on the idea of creating tolerance between different cultures. However, as ideas about diversity and inclusion have developed, the focus has shifted towards how diversity is able to enrich human learning and experience, or can contribute to fostering social cohesion, what is we called often unity in diversity. This powerful phrase has been adopted by numerous organizations, countries, political bodies, and including my own country, Azerbaijan, as a slogan in building up intra-communal, intra-cultural relationships within the country. But what makes diversity important? Why should we tolerate or accept diversity? Allowing diversity into our lives is how we find out new ideas. 
It is how we learn more about the world around us. By exploring other ideas, beliefs, and lifestyles, with an open mind, we open ourselves to exercise creativity and problem solving by looking at these things from different angles. A multicultural exchange of ideas bolsters ideas generation, in turn leading to innovation and creativity. In multicultural environments, a person exposed to different cultures, viewpoints, allows for more contribution and out-of-box thinking. If we only take one perspective about events in the world, we will never understand the other perspective behind them and therefore lock ourselves into a sort of closed-minded ideologies that can be badly exploited or can lead to hate, prejudices, xenophobia, and other dangerous uh, phenomena. The tragic events in New Zealand and the Sri Lanka, in fact, are vivid examples how dangerous ideologies, ideologies can inspire and influence people to do this horrible act. This ignorance can lead to misconceptions which prevent diversity and encourage hatred. And once diversity is accepted, the society has a much higher chances to be internally and externally peaceful due to the lack of ignorance about other people. And here I would like to turn to the model, Azerbaijani model, and to briefly expl explain and describe why Azerbaijan is, is taking this model of multiculturalism. There are maybe two reasons, main reasons, and the, the first answer is in our geography, in our history, as it was already mentioned by many speakers in the opening ceremony also. The answer in our geography and in our history. Historically, Azerbaijan was at the crossroads of the civilizations. Azerbaijan was at the heart of the ancient Silk Road. And uh, as it is called, the melting pot of different cultures and religions and nations. And I think that this interaction, long-standing interactions between cultures and religions shaped out uh, the natural traditions of peaceful coexistence and harmony in the, in the country. But believe me, these traditions we did not take for granted. Uh, as it always happened, all traditions, all those treasures that we have inherited from our fathers, we, it needs to be backed up by policy. It needs back up by, uh, by actions. And the actions are there, policy is there, as it was mentioned by His Excellency President of Azerbaijan, we are doing a lot in terms of promoting this harmony within the country and also outside. Many examples when it comes to the, uh, to the pro protection of rights of the people uh, of different origins, of different cultures, starting from the national legislation, then the different policy initiatives, uh, for instance, the creating the, in 2014, the Baku, uh, uh, multi Baku International Center of Multiculturalism, which deals with the promotion of the uh, the cooperation, intra-communal cooperation and interactions uh, in the Azerbaijan through various activities. And one of them is uh, introducing uh, curriculum, special curriculum on multiculturalism in our uh, higher uh, education institutions. Then 
there are act other activities with regard to the bringing together uh, leaders of the religious communities and celebrating the religious holidays all together, which also sends a very powerful messages to the, their constituencies, to their communities, how people need to, to, to live together and to promote the peaceful coexistence among uh, each other. On international level, of course, the Baku process was mentioned uh, many times. I don't want to repeat uh, that last year we celebrated 10 years of anniversary, and I'm very happy and honored to be in this process since the beginning. And I would tell you that maybe when it was launched, no, no, nobody, no one can think that it will become a global platform of cooperation and the uh, promotion of culture of peace across the continents. It becomes really a global movement which connects people culturally, religiously, bridging, uh, bridging uh, and networking and providing opportunities for networking. We have, of course, uh, many partners of this Baku process, and I would like to, using this opportunity, to appreciate and to express our deepest uh, thanks and gratitude to all partners who believed in this process and who supporting uh, this since its inception. But the, the world shows us that it's not enough. Uh, we need to to redouble or, I don't know, triple our efforts and our actions to promote the culture of peace among societies, among communities. It, the, the recent events, uh, as I said already, in New Zealand and Sri Lanka showed us that we need to, to invest more into the dialogue into the promotion of peace. And we need to invest into the education because the education is one of the powerful tools to promote diversity, to promote the, the harmony, to promote uh, intercultural cooperation. And uh, I believe that today's forum is another opportunity to provide maybe small but very important contribution to this end. And again, I'm very thankful to all those who believe in this process and uh, supporting Azerbaijan in this endeavor. And we are looking forward to continue this cooperation with uh, all stakeholders. And we are ready to embrace all stakeholders to make this process as inclusive as possible, as efficient as possible. In the conclusion, I would like to uh, cite a very important quote by a visionary man who struggled for peace throughout his life, who struggled for, for the dialogue among the cultures and religions, uh, this Mahatma Gandhi. He said that no culture can live if it attempts to be exclusive. So I think it is a guidance to all of us, to all other, to our leaders, to our political masters, that those societies that can be flourished only with those ideas of inclusiveness and diversity and the promotion of peaceful coexistence among each other. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Karimov. Um, I want to uh, perhaps pursue a diversity angle on this and alternate between our panelists in terms of gender. So I will jump to uh, Professor Laurie Beeman, who is a, a Canada Research Chair in Religious Diversity and so Social Change, and I will ask her to uh, open up her, uh, open her uh, participation by a brief statement, and then we'll come back for more discussion. So Laurie, over to you. Yeah? yeah. So I'd like to start by making an observation about language 
And here I'd like to call our attention to the language we're using around diversity and perhaps challenge it a little bit. So the idea of governance or managing diversity I think is stifling our ability to creatively and constructively mobilize diversity as an opportunity. I don't have a solution for you, but I'd like you to simply think about that with me as we are engaged in this conversation about diversity and what might be some language that we could use to open up the conversation to be a bit more creative about what we're talking about. I'd like to also state my normative position, which is, I think, a normative position shared by many of you. And I'm doing this in response to a challenge that was issued by my colleague, Paul Morris, who's also speaking on one of the panels at this forum. And that normative position is that diversity enriches human life. And that's already been expressed today. Um, I think we might all sit here and think, well, don't we all agree with that? But I would suggest to you that actions around the world um, might indicate that, in fact, we don't all think that diversity enriches life, en enriches human life, um, and that, in fact, we might want to think about some of the ways that our behaviors uh, Im impede or thwart the notion that diversity or the normative position that or the response that diversity enriches human life. The challenge here then is not simply to live together. And that also was brought up this morning. Uh, Miguel Moratino suggested convivos. I unfortunately don't know the nuance of Spanish well enough to know whether convivos gets us any further, but I think it's well worth thinking about what is it we're talking about. So in my own work and thinking, I use the notion of living well together. In other words, let's raise the bar from simply living together when we think about living in diversity to living well together. I'd also like to challenge the notion of tolerance. Is tolerance the best we can do? And I've heard the word tolerance many times already today. And I'd like to ask us to maybe, again, think together about whether there is another way to talk about what it is we're doing. Tolerance really doesn't suggest anything that's especially enjoyable. Um, and if we think about diversity as enriching human life, we might also think about something that reflects the joy of that, um, which I would again suggest tolerance doesn't especially do. Nada, uh, Nada al Nashif suggested this morning that we add the word empathy. Uh, I think empathy is very important, but I'd also like to, to suggest some additional elements to what it is we need to be thinking about. And I think we need to set the bar higher than tolerance. So some of the other elements that I've thought about in my own work and um, as a result of some of the research that I've done, first, agonistic respect, which is the idea that sometimes it's not always easy to be in dialogue and action with others and that we might, for example, have to relinquish rightness. We might have to be humble. Um, we might have to come to a, an interaction with humility. Um, and again, to let go of the fact that we are in the right position or we are right in our ideas, to be open, to use um, a phrase that was used uh, just a while ago. The second one is recognition of similarity, looking for our commonalities when we're thinking about diversity and living well together. Um, and I think about this on, in the middle of a continuum between sameness and difference. So it is a, a mistake to think about us as all being the same, and it's also a mistake to focus overly on difference. We need to recognize difference, but also to think, where are our points of similarity? Where are our points of common, commonality? The third thing that I'm thinking about is sharing space as equals. And equality is, I think, a very important word in this conversation. So then thinking about equals and equality, not in terms of hierarchies. And one example from my own context in Canada presently is a kind of transformation that's been happening where the majoritarian religion, which in Canada has been Christianity, um, that those Christian symbols are being translated in some context into my culture, my heritage, um, and then others are talked about as religion. 
and religion that's to be accommodated, um, but I would suggest accommodated at perhaps my whim rather than being an equal. So I think we need to be aware of hierarchies and to think about sharing space as equals. And I would also add um, another group that I haven't heard a lot about today, and that is that this space also includes the non-religious, because we've talked a great deal about people of faith, but we haven't talked at all or much about the non-religious. And that sharing space as equals also includes the non-religious. Fourth is an acknowledgement of, of power and privilege. Um, wherever that may rest for us, sometimes we are in positions of power, in positions of privilege, and we need to acknowledge that and think about ways to use that power, sometimes letting go of some of it, but also ways to participate in the mobilization of diversity for the benefit of everyone. Finally, we need to map success stories, and this is not my final point, but mapping success stories is where I move into the thinking about successful intercultural relations um, and how they're achieved, and that is by doing things together. And we are already doing them. And one of my frustrations in these conversations is sometimes we don't remember that all kinds of people are living well together every day, uh, and we're not paying enough attention to how it is they're doing that. So moving from intercultural dialogue to intercultural action, and that's already been suggested by Fetty in his opening comments that intercultural dialogue, in fact, includes the idea of action, I would suggest we want to start from the notion of action. So action can happen at the individual level, those everyday uh, interactions where people connect, they're kind to each other, they care about each other, they respect each other, they're neighbor neighborly to each other. These are common ways of living. Uh, and yet, I think sometimes we're trying to invent the wheel rather than looking at how people actually achieve those. And then the other way is through groups and communities. And this, I'm, here I'm thinking of action by a wide range of social actors on a shared project or cause where people get to know each other to create new kinds of community. Sometimes we're a little bit old fashioned in the way we think about community. And of course, with Facebook and social media and so on, new kinds of community are being created. There are dangers to some of those new kinds of communities, but there are also some positives too, and I think we should not lose sight of that. So new kinds of community, people acting together, come to see diversity as an asset, an opportunity, and they find similarities that fuel shared commitment. I want to end by briefly mentioning several such projects because I think it's important to have specific examples. One is one that I heard about from a colleague yesterday called the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, which works to pervert, preserve pardon me, the world's rainforest, um, drawing on the knowledge and expertise of indigenous peoples who serve as the rainforest guardians. I'd also like to mention a project in Parkdale, Toronto, called the People's Economy and the Milky Way Garden. Parkdale is a neighborhood in Toronto that attracts migrants and immigrants from all over the world. And here, people are engaging in a shared, a shared project uh, of creating what's called a people's economy, beginning by a collectively owned space in the middle of the city. The space belongs to no one. And this provides an opportunity for people to work together and what my colleague Jason McKinney calls the urban spir spiritual commons. I'd also like to mention Widecast, which is a network of more than 30 countries made up of scientists and volunteers who work together on sea turtle conservation. And you might think that might be an odd thing to bring up, but here we have people who are from a variety of religious perspectives and non-religious perspectives working together for con the conservation of sea turtles. And then finally, finally, I'll mention Greta Thunberg, the Swedish teenager who has led the school strike, strike for climate change, has created a global cross-cultural, intercultural dialogue. And these are the sorts of examples that I think we ought to be paying attention to when we want to think about how to live well together in diversity. I would like to see us spend as much time, energy, and space as is spent on describing conflict and hate as on these sorts of initiatives and thinking about why it is they work, what makes them work, uh, and how we can learn from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. And I think um, what I'm picking up in, in the presentation so far is you've actually in many ways anticipated the questions that will be for the discussion. So I'm very glad you've done that, which means we'll be able to move quickly on 
our interactive questions. Um, I want to move quickly now to His Excellency Dr. Nabil Sharif, Executive Director of the Annalyn Foundation for Dialogue Between Cultures and uh, a former ambassador, minister, and senator in, in, in Jordan. He is a committed advocate for intercultural dialogue. So please join me in welcoming Dr. His Excellency Dr. Nabil Sharif. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Professor Mansouri. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to participate today at this uh, wo Fifth World Forum for Intercultural Dialogue. I would like to express a special thank, to, uh, thank you to the government of Azerbaijan and to UNESCO for the kind invitation that they extended to me to participate in this important forum on the state and future of intercultural dialogue in a world where, sadly, pluralization and mistrust are on the rise. We have an important mission uh, at the Annalyn Foundation, a mission which was conferred upon us by the governments of the Euro-Mediterranean region in 2005, a year of creation, uh, the year of creation of the foundation a mission to be the first institution for the promotion of intercultural dialogue among the population of the Euro-Mediterranean space. Over the last decade, we have tested some methodologies to facilitate exchange and knowledge between the peoples of the region, and we have led research work to monitor people's mutual perceptions and intercultural attitudes to better orientate our action. I would like to share with you some of our initial reflections based on the experience accumulated of what works better and what works less. First of all, on a positive note, our research on intercultural trends shows that there is a growing appetite to, to know more about cultural, political, economic, and social life among the people of the two shores of the Mediterranean. We consider interest and curiosity the first step of the ladder to establish intercultural relations. We also registered in our research that when people have the opportunity to directly interact face-to-face and also virtually, as the internet is the first tool for intercultural, intercultural interaction for people of the southern and eastern Mediterranean region, they change their perceptions of the other in a more positive way than negative, and the impact of direct interaction manages to override the more negative impact of the media on mutual perceptions. At the value level, we also register something which goes against common media headlines of populist discourses. That is, the majority of people, over 80%, in the societies both north and south of the Mediterranean, consider diversity as a source of social prosperity that they consider cultural and religious minorities should be granted equal rights as the majority of the population. However, a minority of Europeans, 40%, and 30% uh, of people in southern and eastern Mediterranean countries consider diversity as a potential threat to social stability, but they are the minority. This indicator of intercultural dialogue allows the Annalyn Foundation to keep the pulse of cooperation and people's openness or resistance to dialogue efforts in the region and to understand in which way the geopolitical context impacts on them. We can, in this way, reorientate our action based on actual needs and priorities. I would like to conclude by acknowledging the value of this World Forum for Intercultural Dialogue as an initiative by its very nature, brings together hundreds of stakeholders 
committed to the same goal and that gives us the opportunity to learn about what all of us are doing and exchange on what we have learned from the experience. This is one of the main conditions to develop strategies for the successful management of diversity. We need to be informed, first of all. We need to work in uh, partnership. We also need to create a sense of community among the people and organizations active in dialogue. In this regard, I am happy to announce the renewed collaboration between UNESCO and the Annalind Foundation, which is based on the prerequisite for dialogue work and which is oriented to the implementation of operational measures to, trans to transform our shared strategic uh, orientation and, uh, uh, into opportunities for the people we cater for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Nabil Sharif. Uh, I think uh, I'm moving now closer to home, home meaning where I'm, I'm living right now, which is Australia, and I would love to uh, invite uh, Ms. Lisa Anis, who is the Chief uh, Executive Officer of a very uh, active uh, council in Australia, Diversity Council of Australia, which is leading really a lot of public debates around issues of diversity, inclusion, and, uh, and other related topics. So uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, and thank you for your warm welcome here today. And I'd like to congratulate the government of Azerbaijan for putting on um, such a wonderful convention that enables um, this dialogue to occur and hopefully with the intention that as we all return back to our own jurisdictions that we are inspired to bring some of what we've learnt back. I'm the beneficiary of um, coming from a very multicultural country. Australia has, um, has a very rich tapestry of diversity, not unlike Canada, um, as one of my fellow panellists is also from, which is different to lots of other countries in the world where there might be one very dominant group and lots of um, minority groups or some minority groups within it. So the organisation I lead, we do quite a lot of research. We try and support um, individuals and organisations, so workplaces, improve um, outcomes based not just on diversity um, but on inclusion. So I'd like to up the challenge put down by Laurie that we talk about diversity and actually suggest that we move towards looking at inclusion because we all know that diversity um, is about things that make one group different from another and that can be because of our cultural or religious affiliation, um, but it could also be our gender, it could be our socioeconomic status, our level of education, or many other factors. And those factors really depend on the jurisdiction on which you're from. Implicit in that also is to understand that there's a construct in every country um, which supports an infrastructure by which diversity and inclusion can happen in a meaningful way. You may, um, be, you may be from a country that has ratified many, many UN conventions, and so therefore you have a legal framework upon which you can um, base the work that you're doing. Or you may be from a country that does not have as many of them, and so it's more challenging to get a robust um, framework in place. And my observation is that it's really important to try and present diversity and inclusion in a positive light to ensure its success. Um, I hope to direct you to a practical tool, and I have a physical copy of it. You can download it from our website. Um, but it's an index that DCA developed on how to measure inclusion. And so I put it to you that inclusion is four things, um, and that diversity without inclusion could just mean lots of different people living side by side but never interacting. But we've actually established that inclusion means that human beings are connected to one another, um, that they're operating within a, um, within a place where there's mutual respect, so, so there's no disrespect or discrimination and certainly no violence, um, where people feel as though what they do has value, 
so they're not being tolerated, as has been um, suggested is not probably the best word to use, um, but also that there are opportunities for them, so the opportunity to progress. All, those, all four of those items need to be in place for inclusion to be seen to be in operation. We've run a very large scale project that has measured this across our labour market and we're repeating that again this year. Um, and I would you know, welcome you all to, to read that piece of work that we have. I'd like to, I'm conscious of only having five minutes, but I'd like to focus on three things that make any intervention in the diversity and inclusion space successful because dialogue is really important, conversations are important, and inspiration is really important. But what we've found in our experience of um, having 30 years experience improving outcomes for diverse groups in Australia is that the framing of any activity has to, should be about unifying people rather than about being divisive. So to try and always present and emphasise the opportunities in any initiative rather than the cost. Um, and if you do have to measure cost to try and see how that works in the context of opportunity. We also take a partnership approach in everything we do and that approach um, works across industry, across government, we work with academia, but we also utilise traditional and non-traditional social media outlets um, and we engage very heavily with the um, workplace community, with the corporate community um, to ensure that we have a multi-level approach to all of the work that we do. And the final reason our work is so successful in Australia is that we take, um, we take the, the idea of self-determination very seriously. And what I mean by that is um, a phrase that I like to call nothing about us without us. So we wouldn't do a project in Australia about a community without involving that community. Um, that idea of having self-determination at the heart of it is really important to the success of any initiative um, around diversity where you hope to achieve a genuine goal of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. And uh, last but not least, of course, is uh, our friend Jean-Christophe Barr, who is very well known to many of us here. Uh, Jean-Christophe is currently the CEO of the Dialogue of Civilizations Research Institute, but in my view, more importantly, he's been really doing a number of significant leadership roles previously with the World Bank, but in another capacity where I got to know him and work with him closely, where he was uh, head of strategic development and partnerships in the AOC, uh, UN AOC. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, JC. Thank you, Feti, uh, for your kind word of introduction. Um, I would like also to, before starting, you know, to express my gratitude to the government of Azerbaijan um, and also to congratulate the government of Azerbaijan for taking this initiative. Uh, my friend, uh, Ambassador Karimov, said before that uh, nobody, really truly nobody, would have thought 10 years ago when this uh, process started that uh, it would become a global platform, a, a connectors of uh, multiple initiatives. And in a way, I take pride of uh, having been there from the start. I'm probably one of the very few, if not the only one, with the government of Azerbaijan in having taken part of the each, every single edition of the Baku uh, Forum. And um, I have seen, I mean, year after year, how it has expanded, how it has managed really to bring under the tent the multiple players and actors. And you were mentioning, Feti, in your introduction that the topics that we are discussing are, in a way, multi-sectorial and multi-level. And I think that to be put to the credit of the Baku process is really that uh, it is going beyond just, let's say, the, the small community or constituency of champions in diversity, really, to bring uh, multiple actors and players. One reason also why I mentioned this uh, journey of the past 10 years is not just to say that uh, one day I will receive the, the medal of a veteran for the Baku process, but uh, is to say that 
we need to acknowledge and also we need to be realistic about the way things have evolved. The way we talk today about diversity and intercultural dialogue and understanding is not the same as it was 10 years ago. And it's a bit ironic, you know, because the Baku process, UNESCO, the Alliance of Civilization, Annaline Foundation and all have been really doing a fantastic work to promote and to champion diversity and intercultural understanding. And even so, we see the situation where we are today. And I think, you know, this is also to the credit of the High Representative Moratinos this morning when he said, have we failed in a way? Uh, why is it that the world is in such a situation today? Because of course we can keep on saying that uh, uh, everything is fine and that we are making good progress, but the reality that we see in most part of the world is somewhat uh, different. And I'm mentioning that because I think it relates very much to your introduction, Feti, about this multi-sectorial and multi-level dimension. Diversity is not a discipline in its own. You know, you will not promote diversity in just uh, addressing the diversity issue. This is, let's say, a multi-stakeholder and a 360 degrees perspective. <clears throat> and you cannot evidently disconnect the issue of diversity, the issue of coexistence from a broader issue which is the way in the past 20 or 30 years the globalization process has evolved. We are just a few months ahead of the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It is a tremendous change. I mean, this is really the U-turn in the modern history of the world, in a way, because it has had cascading consequences. And that was supposed to be the end of history. That was supposed to be the prevalence of one model of pluralism, of democracy, of uh, values, of uh, respect, and so on and so on. And what we see now is that the world, at the time where we are about to celebrate the 30th anniversary, is in a very different shape. I represent an organization that is called Dialogue of Civilization Institute. It has been working for the past 17 years on these issues and that have developed uh, from the start the conviction that globalization is not and should not be just setting standards. The way it has been developing in the past 20 or 30 years was really to create standards, economic standards, financial standards, trade standards, in order to, let's say, unleash the tremendous economic and financial benefit of globalization, which in a way has benefited to not just a few, but you know, it has developed tremendous uh, uh, resources for developing a middle class in many countries like China and others. But in a way, the globalization process has ignored or dismissed one major component, is the human the cultural and civilizational component. We have created a scheme or a framework to make globalization work from a business, an economic, a financial perspective without having in mind that at the very heart of the process we should have thought about the human dimension and how in opening up borders, in opening the flows of goods, the flows of finance, the flows of investment, how the human, in just one generation, would have to do a sort of a radical mutation, a radical change in terms of mindset to understand and to embrace the radical change. And I think this is something we need to have in mind, uh, is really to look at the very broad picture uh, when it comes to, uh, to diversity. I still have one minute. <laughs> um, 
you, I, I mean, I, I really congratulate UNESCO and I mean, the authors of the, the concept paper really about this multi-sectorial and multi-level uh, uh, dimension because I think this is fundamental. I have the absolute conviction that in a way, and it's a bit ironic with what I just said, is that there is one major actor that is usually missing in those discussions. It's the private sector. When it comes to championing diversity, you realize that the private sector is way, 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 way ahead of the policy-making process. In the corporate environment, in the business environment, in the working environment, a diversity is seen, and there is no philosophical endless discussion about it. It is seen as the major asset. The reason how and why you can innovate, the reason why and how you can create value and benefit, is because you have the capacity to bring the best talents from different culture, different perspective, different sensibility. And even so, the private sector or the corporate or the working environment is very, very far ahead. It is not usually part of the discussion when it comes to, as we said, the managing diversity, where I'm always a bit, as you said, a bit uncomfortable about the word managing uh, 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 or governance of diversity. I think, but uh, uh, I think it is very important it would be very important, I mean, and, and, and eventually to anticipate in the second part of the discussion, is really to see how to involve and how to engage and how to build on the experience of the private sector or the corporate environment to promote diversity. Because we are a little bit in a schizophrenic situation where we as workers or employees or whatever, uh, we feel very comfortable in our working environment with diversity because we know that if our company is doing well, it's because we are diverse. And in a way, I, I don't know if he's in the room. Uh, I remember a few years ago uh, during the Baku process, uh, we launched uh, uh, a slogan contest. And um, uh, one of the, not one, I mean the winner of the slogan contest was an Australian. Uh, and, 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 and uh, Peter Musafiriadis, who came up with this slogan, we were saying, uh, I think, divided we fail, uh, united we stand, and diverse we grow. And I think it's very telling in a way. It is very telling that, I mean, if you really want to grow, if you really want to expand, if you really want to succeed, if you really want to win, you need to be diverse. And it is so obvious in the working environment. Why is it that in terms of policy debate, we are still way, way, way behind that. And as an illustration, it's very interesting to see that most of the large multinational companies, they have, usually at a very, very senior level, usually at the VP level, a chief diversity officer, uh, which, I mean, usually the title is Vice President Diversity and Inclusion, which is a way to demonstrate or to show that we want to take advantage of diversity to promote inclusion and to be more effective. And in comparison, let's say the counterpart in the government would be the Minister of Immigration, which is seen, I mean, if you use the word of immigration, is very much as a threat to say, how do we cope and how do we block immigration? So, I mean, maybe it's a detail, but it is very telling about the different approach that the policy environment and the corporate environment have about diversity. And I think this is something that uh, should be discussed further. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I think uh, because you, your presentations have been so rich and there's, there's a lot of density and, and, and context in it, you've touched already upon some of the questions that I have prepared for you. What I would like to do now is actually perhaps reframe my questions a little bit to ensure that we elicit maybe a little bit uh, more uh, diversity of, of views. Uh, Laurie mentioned uh, living well together. We heard this morning in the plenary session the notion of conviviality. Um, and we talked, and we agree, I think, all of us, that there are certainly certain societal conditions 
for this living with, world with diversity to be able to be achieved. And I would like to ask, uh, perhaps, uh, I will start with two of the panelists and then others can also uh, join the conversation, and I will direct my questions later on to different members of our panel. I perhaps would like to ask, uh, start with Professor Laurie Beeman, and perhaps also if uh, the, His Excellency Dr. Nabil Sharif wants to join in. What would you characterize as being the optimal societal conditions which could lead to this notion of living well together or conviviality in relation to uh, cultural diversity. So we'll start with you, Laurie. Sure. Um, I think I would go back to Lisa's comment, actually, um, uh, about inclusion. And so thinking about moving from diversity as simply a statement of fact uh, about how we're all living together to thinking about inclusion and maybe going further and measuring. I think that point is really, really important to actually measure whether people feel included. When I think about the basic conditions for achieving living well together, I think here we have to also be very aware of specific contexts and histories. And so, for example, in the context which I'm, uh, with which I'm most familiar, the Canadian context, we've drawn on the notion of multiculturalism for a long, long time. Um, even as it's fallen out of fashion, uh, particularly in Europe, where it has been explicitly rejected by a number of leaders, we still use the language of multiculturalism. We had a period of time for about 10 years when it fell out of fashion in Canada as well but we are finding that it is reviving a little bit. We're kind of stuck with the idea of multiculturalism in Canada, and the reason we're stuck with it is because it's in our Charter of Rights. And so we have to talk about it. We, eventually, we have to come back to it. But that's a platform in Canada that works. There's tons of critical literature on it, as I'm sure many of you know. But we've had to think about how does this notion of multiculturalism play out? And I think one of the vital things around that is to actually ask, are there ways that this concept or this ideology um, or a statement of fact, because it's all of those things, are there ways that that impedes flourishing? and impedes inclusion. Um, so I'm not really sure if I've answered your question properly, Fati, but I would say that we need to also be context-specific, thinking about particular histories, and of course, the Canadian history is a unique one, as is that of each of our countries, um, and then asking for other people that might argue that the notion of interculturalism um, is a more appropriate, or republicanism, and I've heard all of these things in conversations today and the conversations that we had yesterday. So we need to be very aware of context-specific elements to ask then before we reject out of hand, we need to be um, respectful and think about what is each place engaging in that draws on their histories and their strengths, and then ask the question about questions about inclusion and human flourishing. Thank you, Laurie. I'm, I'm just reminded of the fact that uh, we have some interested uh, audience members who would like to ask questions. We'll come to the audience in a minute, but we have some uh, a few uh, more questions. And Dr. Nabil, please. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Fatih. Uh, I would just like to add on this issue the importance of uh, utilizing uh, the tools that we have, especially in the uh, field of education and in the field of media. Because what we found out through our research uh, through our important uh, report, which is called Intercultural Trends Report, uh, which is published every three years, uh, we found out that the media actually is playing a, a negative role in uh, portraying people of the two shores of the uh, Mediterranean. In other words, people's perceptions were much better than they were portrayed by the media. So we really have to uh, work with these tools, and I would like to uh, applaud UNESCO for its work on uh, the uh, uh, media culture or media education programs uh, in our region, in, in the world, because it's, it's through programs like that you start from the very beginning, before, before things become twisted and complicated, and you have uh, deep-rooted stereotypes that you cannot fight. Let's work with the very young, with people, before they are really formulated somehow in a not positive manner. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you, Dr. Nabil. I would like to perhaps ask Ambassador Karim of a follow-up question on this particular one. I mean, we know and we've heard, and you mentioned this um, the, again, uh, Ambassador, that Azerbaijan itself is a, is a, a model of multiculturalism and uh, peaceful coexistence of different faith uh, communities and different ethnic communities. And I would like you to perhaps uh, reflect a little bit more with us now on what do you think, in addition to this demographic fact of life that Azerbaijan has these, this diversity, what has Azerbaijan done in terms of perhaps specific policies or perhaps in terms of certain uh, approaches to leadership that enabled this uh, success story to emerge? Thank you, Fatih. It's, thank you for this question. Uh, I think in my presentation I mentioned that uh, we, we didn't take what has been inherited by, by our fathers uh, for granted. Uh, there was uh, serious actions and the understanding, the vision, clear vision of our leadership that we need to promote and we need to, to cherish what has been uh, achieved so far, uh, those traditions of peaceful coexistence and harmony in the country. And of course, there were actions and real actions and policy, and a very well calibrated, I would say, policy, because when it comes to the religions and ethnicities, you need to be very sensitive and you need to design a policy in a way that you will not harm any feelings of any, any particular community. So I think the, the, the major role play the leaders of the, inter of the religious communities. When you see the leaders are coming together and celebrating some festive events, it sends a really a powerful messages to their respective communities that this is the example and this is the model that they should follow in relationship with the, with the other uh, religious communities in the country. Uh, I would give you one very peculiar example. Uh, there is one religious holiday in Azerbaijan. We called it Ashura. And, and during this holiday, uh, this is a religious holiday, the leaders of those religious communities gathered together and went to the hospital uh, where this blood diseases, leukemia uh, people were there, and they donated their blood uh, to the to the to this hospital, and it 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 was a rather symbolical uh, action or message, which says that the blood is uh, we have different religions or ethnicities, but this blood is the same to all of us. So uh, and it was very well perceived and received by in the society, and I think it strengthens for, um, further. Uh, this uh, spirit of cooperation and the peaceful coexistence in the country. Many other uh, actions and initiatives have been taken so far, uh, so I don't want to, to go into details, but in general, I think the, the, the biggest role belongs to the religious leaders. Thank you. Uh, just moving on, and I'm, again, I'm aware of uh, the need to uh, ensure that our audience can also participate in this discussion. Just one final question, which has two parts to it, which I would like Jean-Christophe and um, uh, uh, Lisa to, to respond to. Jean-Christophe, what you talked about the private sector being ahead in this game, and they've done a tremendous amount of work in relation to how diversity is approached. Are you able to reflect with, and, and perhaps share with us specifically what does that being ahead look like in real terms, in terms of what they did to ensure that diversity is embraced as an absolutely asset in the operation of those private sector organizations? And then I would just the second part of this question to Lisa, which is how do we know that certain approaches, certain initiatives actually work and deliver? So we'll go with the part A with Jean-Christophe, then Lisa. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I can refer to a um, research or uh, publication that we did uh, with the UN uh, uh, AOC a few years ago that was called uh, Doing Business in a Multicultural World. And in a way where we have been kind of uh, compiling uh, multiple initiatives from multiple business and corporation around the world, who were trying to find, let's say, very practical uh, way to promote diversity 
I mean, first in terms of the composition of the workforce, really making sure that uh, 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 not just the workforce, but also the board, uh, you know, those who are in charge of the, the strategy, you know, would come up with different cultural perspective uh, because they can understand the multiple needs. You know, I mean, one of the key challenges for multi, multinational corporation is not just to have the multinational, the multi, uh, uh, perspective, but also how to combine the multi, multi, I mean, the global perspective with the local needs or the local tradition. And so having teams, I mean, at the governance level, at the board level, at the multiple level that are multicultural is, of course, a way, it's an asset. Um, that's one example. But you have many other examples. You know, for instance, uh, I remember the one group, you know, which uh, created a canteen where, uh, uh, you know, evidently uh, the workers and the people could, you know, have uh, uh, meals that was corresponding to their, to their needs. When I see in many countries, you know, this terrible discussion about, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the school and the canteen at school, you know, and this kind of, uh, it's like a, a, a political revolution. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to see that in the corporate environment, this is sought out in a very easy way and in a very pragmatic way. So there are multiple examples of that source, you know, in terms of uh, uh, workforce, in terms of strategy, in terms of governance, in terms of day-to-day uh, -day activity on how to cope with diversity of culture and diversity of religion, which, of course, is also becoming a very important issue. You know, I remember we discovered at that time, you know, the, this idea of the, what was called the, the floating days, you know, because uh, you have in many countries um, uh, uh, bank holi holidays that are very much religious and that are really very much aligned with one religion. And many corporations, you know, allowed or agreed with that uh, people who were not of that religion could, instead of being imposed one given day, I mean, if I take the example of my country, I feel a bit, in a way, ashamed to say that France, which is supposed to be a secular, non-religious country, I mean, three, three quarters of the national holidays are religious, but they are not only religious, they are all Christian, and they are not only Christian, they are all Catholic. Um, and so many people, you know, I mean, the re they don't even know the meaning of the religious day, it just means for them, you know, a long weekend. And uh, I think this obviously shows, you know, the, the gap between the corporate environment and the government. I mean, evidently, and I know it is a very touchy and a very sensitive issue, but evidently, I mean, government, in terms of getting back to inclusion, how can you expect to promote inclusion in a country where all the national holidays are religious and only a single-oriented religion. And interestingly, the corporate, I mean, many interna uh, corporate uh, 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 sector, they have decided that people would not be forced or obliged to take the day off that day, but they would take a day off, the day that represents their own important religious day. And, uh, Lisa, in terms of how we actually measure success in terms of some of these initiatives? In all the research and the work that we've done, one of the things that we've noticed is that unless you determine up front what it's going to look like when you've achieved diversity and inclusion, um, you won't actually really know that it's worked. And most of the work we do is actually in the private sector um, because you're right, they most, and 30% of our member organisations are global multinationals who are committed to diversity and inclusion. But often there's a whole lot of activity that happens without an assessment of whether or not it worked. And so my advice would be to decide how are you going to determine whether you've had success in any particular initiative. And the way to do that is to um, set up the metrics for that success up front so that you can then measure them later on. And that will be meaningful depending on what your approach is and what it is you're trying to achieve. You could be looking at in, you know, creating a more diverse and inclusive community 
and look at things like employment, productivity. Um, it could be things like crime. You could be looking at poverty statistics or homelessness statistics, or it could be things such as um, you could be looking at targets of the number of different representations at senior levels in government. But it's important to determine up front if we are going to make this commitment to diversity and inclusion, we need to know how we'll measure its success. Because then you can recalibrate at the end of a process and determine what things you want to continue, what worked, what didn't work, but importantly, why things did or didn't work. And that was the genesis of the idea behind the inclusion index that I mentioned in my five minutes. We determined how there's all this activity that's happening out there, really well-intentioned activity, but no one really knows whether anything is working. People think, well, we'll just give this a go and then we'll just assume it's going to work. So we took a very a sophisticated approach at being able to identify how do you measure inclusion? And I get back to those four things, which are measurable um, through, we used a survey technique to measure through a whole series of questions, but how connected do people feel? Um, how respected do they feel? Do they feel that what they do has value? And do they think that they have an opportunity or the ability to progress? Those four things need to be there for an activity to be determined to be effective in terms of diversity and inclusion. But you have to think of that up front um, so that you can measure it later on. I think uh, it's clearly the case that we could spend another 90 minutes really discussing some of these questions with our distinguished members of this panel. We won't do that, of course, because we're already uh, actually uh, ahead of the time allocated to us. We have promised and we will keep our promise in terms of allowing a couple of questions from the floor. I only ask, please, I know you've raised your hand, I'm, I'm aware of you, I'll, I'll come, but I only ask, please, that either you make your cool comment very briefly, or if it's a question, then be very precise in your question because we would like to be able to take maybe more than one question. There is a open mic now. I can see the microphone. It's over there. So if I can see a show of hands of how many questions we have, we'll take all the questions at once, and then we'll try to come back to the uh, panel so that we minimize wasting more time as much as possible. So just uh, briefly introduce yourself and your you question, much, please. Thank you very much, Madhuata. You didn't leave uh, for time for us for the question and comments, but nevertheless, thank you very much for giving the floor. Ali Sheri Kramov, Secretary General National Commission of Uzbekistan for UNESCO. So it's not comment, it's proposals for the final document of the Baku process, if you allow me. Uh, I, th I think during this panel, we have to think about the future for forward-looking opportunities. What's forward-looking now? Recent session of executive board adopted decision to elaborate standard setting document on ethics on artificial intelligence. So we are approaching the era where the artificial intelligence will charge what's the discrimination, what's the inequality, a violent conflict. If you remember, at the beginning we had just in the mid of 20s we had Isaac Asimov's famous three laws on robots. Robots does, does not, should not endure the human being, etc. Huh? I'm not going to. So now we are approaching the time when four years ago in Davos Forum, nine issues been allocated as uh, ethics issues of artificial intelligence. And I think now that we could maybe proposal that the Baku process will contribute for elaboration of this, uh, because recently in executive board they discussed already feasibility studies on elaborating. The reason why I'm saying this is so important. I could demonstrate through several examples. Artificial intelligence, as one of the distinguished panelists said, it's mostly doing private sector, like Google, Yahoo, Amazon, etc., Alibaba. They elaborating algorithms, and these algorithms will change labor market drastically. Many, many people will be unemployed. So inequality will be started. These algorithms working on the recognition of images. Racism issues could be raised. Right. Many, many issues is coming. Uh, can I please maybe, ask, can, And my proposals, uh, I just want another example. Please. I will tell you why this uh, violent conflict could be by artificial intelligence. Last year, Danish experts on software, they created artificial intelligence. They provided tutoring to the machine by putting, downloading all literature in Denmark. And on the computer, they asked the question, where is the 
Devil is living in Denmark. Funny question. And you know, the computer replied. The place was next to the Catholic Church. It's a computer, it's a robot. And the, the explanation was very easy. Why? Because in literature, because in Denmark, it's a Protestant country. Okay. Thank, most thank of you. the Can literature I, related with the critics of the Catholics. Please. Therefore, Can, the proposal that the Baku process will be contribute for the elaboration of this new vision of ethics of artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence, tomorrow they will manage the world. It's, it's a reality which we are approaching, particularly now. And therefore, I mean, it was both something like forward-looking and role of multi-sectorality, multi-level. Thank, Thank you. Very much, Ms. Uh, we'll, we'll, I think we'll take that as a comment, but if you want to respond, you can respond. Can I please stress that please be specific in the question you ask so we can take as many as we can. Uh, I saw someone... Yes, you... Uh, ben Azerbaijan dilinde danışacağım. Tercüme olup danışak ya günkü sualım. Small speaking... Yeah. All right. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Teşekkür ederim Fatih. Bu kompliment değil. Reallıktı ki bu paneli çok meharetle idare ediz. Güzel tahlil ediz. Ben Azerbaycan Diller Üniversitesi'ni temsil ediyorum. Anar Mellim'in burada gayetleri çok düzgündü. Ona elave edebilirim ki Azerbaycan'da multikulturalizm heygeten reallıktı. Biz özümüzle bilmeden esirler boyu multikultural bir şeraitte yaşamışıq ve indi onu artık nezeri şekilden kıymetlendirdik ve yazdık. Çok kitablar yazıldı. Azerbaycan'da ve dünyanın bir sıra ülkelerinde Azerbaycan modeli, multikulturalizmin Azerbaycan modeli tədris edilir. Diller Üniversitesi'nde 21 dil tədris olunur Azerbaycan'da. Ve çok ülkelerin merkezleri var. Dil ve onların medeniyetinin öğrenilmesi merkezi var. Biz indi onların medeniyetini öğrenirik ve zenginleşirik. Benim için maraqlıdır. Çok dikkatle kulak astım. Lorinin de çıkışına, Liz'in de çıkışına, herkesin. Teşekkür ederim. Onların da ülkelerinde, ister mektep, ister universit seviyesinde, Multikulturalizmin hansısa bir modeli öğrenilir mi? Ve e, üzül istedim, Anna Lind e, fondu ile, mesela Heydar Ali fondu arasında bir layihe yaratmak olar mı? Multikulturalizmin öğrenilip dünyaya yayılması için. Teşekkür ederim. Thank you. Thank you for that. We, we do have a question, so I'll take one third, perhaps a question from, from you, and then we'll, we'll come back to the panel. Uh, please, here, the microphone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Actually, I have a very, very quick question uh, regarding the diversity. Uh, what we heard, I think it's very good. We know that, you know, diversity in Azerbaijan, really, we, we are trying to keep it. But in reality, if we are looking to the world, and we have here two panelists from um, Australia and from Canada, and thank you, Laurie, you at least somehow touched to this issue, because, you know, multiculturalism was actually declared in Canada, let's say, in the late 60s. In that case, if we are looking from that perspective, there are some kind of... Uh, uh, ideas about its failure. And from this perspective, as a country, um, Austria, Australia and Canada, which you have your own kind of models, and I abs absolutely agree that the context and history were important in this uh, situation. Uh, what do you recommend for the kind of uh, the people, especially, uh, I don't think so that we should compare, for example, different contexts, but I agree with you that uh, definitely inclusion is important, but it's one of the elements. It's not only the one. What other elements is important if we are looking for the success stories, for best kind of Thank ideas? You. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very specific question. I think we have two or three questions, and I'm happy for some of our panelists to perhaps respond very, very briefly. Uh, we start with you, Dr. Nabil. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a question direct, uh, 
directed at, uh, to, to the Annaland Foundation, so I'd like to respond to it. But before that, I would like also to respond to the first comment that was made about forward-looking, very important uh, contribution. Uh, and it is actually linked to what I wanted to, uh, to say in response to the question. First of all, I think, yes, we do have to be forward-looking at this uh, rapidly changing uh, world. And uh, what we should uh, concentrate on is first partnership between uh, entities, organizations, governments that have the same vision. And definitely, uh, Azerbaijan is very well positioned to play a, reading, a leading role in this regard. And of course, the summit that we have today is a testimony uh, to this work. So uh, more partnerships, more networking, more exchange of experiences between organizations working in different parts of the world to, towards the same goals is really very important. This is uh, number one. Number two, actually, is yes, we do have to, more to do more work online uh, uh, to really reach the youth, the young people of the world who are uh, mostly targeted by extremist ideologies. So we do have to reach them through online. And of course, we are doing our part at the Annaland Foundation. We have a whole program uh, called Erasmus Plus that is dedicated to uh, uh, a virtual exchange between young people of the region. Now, in response to the question that was directed about the possibility of partnership between the Anna Lind Foundation and the Haider Aliyev Foundation, I'm, uh, of course, uh, on behalf of uh, the Anna Lind Foundation, I would be more than happy, my colleagues and I would be more than happy to look into the possibility because we do have many uh, partnerships, MOUs, with different organizations, we hope to be able, uh, it is in the process, in the pipeline, to have an MOU with UNESCO. Uh, and of course, we have uh, partnerships and uh, uh, agreements with a, a large number of organizations uh, throughout the world. So it would be my pleasure to look into this uh, uh, possibility for the uh, mutual benefit of all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Nabil Sharif. I think we, we have two other specific questions in relation to Azerbaijan, but also in relation to the success stories. So I'm not sure whether Ambassador Karimov or others want to perhaps provide a few extra additional comments. Uh, or Lori on success? I think the questions yeah. were addressed to our distinguished panels about the cases in their respective countries. Or, but. I can only add that Azerbaijan is always open and ready to, to, to share its, uh, the model uh, with the entire world and the, the organization of today's forum and the, the previous forums and the overall the Baku process is really aimed to, to promote this uh, experience and to, to, to give this uh, example uh, to to promote this example to others. So we are ready on different uh, forums to discuss these possibilities of cooperation. And that's what we are doing in UNESCO as ambassador of Azerbaijan to UNESCO. We are using every occasion to, to demonstrate uh, our model and to seek partnership and also to, to learn from others. I think it's a never ending exercise. I mean. Uh, we always find something new for us to learn and to apply in, 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 in our societies. But of course, we are always ready and uh, feel proud to share our own experience, which I believe, again, is, uh, is worth it to, to explore. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Karimov. Uh, I mean, we, as you can see, the reason why I was standing up because I think we are coming to the natural conclusion of this discussion. I would love perhaps to give you the opportunity now to say one final, uh, perhaps, observation, no more than 30 seconds, uh, and I'm, and I'm going to go start with Lisa because uh, we need to wrap it up. Um, the only thing I, I would say is, is I think a successful approach is always a, an approach that engages the government sector, the private sector, community organisations and academia, but also is able to access media. I think as a cautionary tale, I know in our jurisdiction getting 
to, to what you said about multiculturalism mm. um, in Australia, the rise of, of certain right-wing ideologies, which is a hostile to multiculturalism. I think it's really important to maintain a focus on evidence and to try and disrupt um, the presentation of opinions as facts in media, especially social mm. media, as a way to ensure that we, we tell the truth yeah. and we don't buy into factitious ideologies. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Christophe, any final? It's a 45 seconds. 45 <laughs> seconds, OK. Um, I think the challenge is actually to reconcile the two dividing lines. I think uh, most countries around the world, from the north, the south, the east, and the west, uh, are suffering some sort of a, a, a double dividing line. The vertical divide, which is between, let's say, the globalist and the localist, which are going in two radically opposed directions. And then there is an horizontal divide between the secular, as you said, you know, the, the issue is not just among the religion, but between the religious and, and the yeah. secular. And this is, we also see in many countries a growing gap between those who consider that we as individuals have nothing else but uh, the, uh, the illustration of uh, a spiritual force, and those who are at the other side of the spectrum who say that religion has nothing to do with the public sphere. So we have this double divide that in a way exists in most societies around the world and that is increasingly polarized also because of social media and also because of some sort of a global crackdown in civility around the world. But in reality, most societies, the majority of the people are in between, those who oscillate between the global and the local and between the religious and the secular, who in a way would like to have a little bit of, a little bit of everything and this is what we could call, let's say, the, the, the silent majority of the moderate. And I think that one of the key challenges in order to promote the living together is really to find how to combine harmoniously, in a peaceful way, the legitimate aspiration of the global and the local and the religious and the secular. And I really stress this word of legitimate because, you know, the problem is that the debate has been very much to dismiss the other, to consider, I mean, the local consider the global as the redneck, and the, lo and the local consider the global as the, those who are losing their ground, and so on and so forth. And I think the real challenge is to see how to build a constituency of the moderate who will, in a way, advocate and promote a model of living together. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Uh, Laurie, final thoughts? Try to be quick. Um, multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is, first of all, a demographic fact. It's like diversity. It's a demographic fact. The question is, what do we do with it? What do you do when many people live together in a society? And that's, I think, the question we're both struggling with. Um, we learn from each other. And so I think to answer the question about education in Canada, yes, multiculturalism has formed a part of the education platform. And by and large, multiculturalism has been taught as being an asset or an opportunity, not a disadvantage. So that's moving it from a demographic fact into more of an ideology or a strategy for thinking about citizenship hasn't always been successful. We've been struggling with the issue of reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples right now, and the, the Indigenous peoples of Canada have been largely excluded from the project of multiculturalism and indeed from the state, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, I'll leave you with one quick anecdote, an, an, anecdote and then maybe that will help. Um, I've been involved in a research study of Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist youth, and when we've asked them, you know, can you, are you free to express your religion in Canada and so on, they'll say yes, and then they'll often refer to multicultural and say, well, Canada is a multicultural country. So they kind of invoke it as a, a demographic reality combined with ideology. So that's one project I've been involved in. And then one of my PhD students studied atheists in the Ottawa area. And he said, well, are you, are you OK to express your atheism? Because we know in the United States this is a bit of a problem. And they said, yeah, 
yeah, Canada is a multicultural country. And I think the fact that those, you can position those two side by side is a really interesting statement about the success of multiculturalism as an ideology beyond uh, demographic reality, that people feel included whether, no matter where they fit themselves on a spectrum of faith or non-faith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, Ambassador Karimov, would you like to conclude? Oh, you're fine. Uh, Dr. Nabi, you're so fine. Uh, I, think, I think that really says it all, that we, we've managed to really uh, exhaust uh, our discussions in relation to so many different uh, dimensions of, of this debate. I want to obviously uh, wrap it up by reflecting also on, on two key uh, issues that we need to be mindful of. One is that whilst it's true we are here, we are talking about some of the challenges which are facing the diversity uh, program, the diversity agenda, let us not really lose sight of the fact that most societies have historically have been very diverse in terms of ethnic, linguistic, and religious groups, and that they've managed to live together, live well together in diversity, and embrace notions of conviviality. And that goes back to ancient civilizations, to medieval civilizations, and even to many contemporary societies. So what we need to do really also is to be mindful, be aware that the stories that are making headlines in relation to hate crimes, in relation to white extremist ideologies, in relation to jihadi uh, kind of uh, terrorist activities, are in many cases quite small minorities of our global societies. We do a lot of research in Australia about attitudes, and I can tell you, since these attitudinal surveys have been conducted, that's gone back to the mid-60s, we have had a consistently, overwhelmingly uh, positive views towards diversity and migration, and it, that fluctuated between 70 and 80 percent. That is a very rock-solid majority of Australians who have positive attitudes towards diversity and migration, and I'm sure that in other societies the figures will be slightly different, but nevertheless, majority of individual, ordinary citizens are able to live their everyday lives in very much full harmony with, with the diverse environments within which they live. So we need to ensure that those stories of historical but also geographical success of being able to live with the diversity also are being communicated. And I think this is where media has a role to play, leadership has a role to play. And I, let me also remind all of us the uh, really sad attacks in, in New Zealand, Christchurch on those two mosques, that the leadership of New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, the way she handled the whole crisis has given all of us really, in the region but globally, a template of how ethical, transformative, uh, organic leadership should look like. It was very inclusive in the language she used. She was very authentic and really uh, uh, showed a lot of empathy towards everyone, no, no less than the victims themselves. So I think we need to reflect on those positive stories too. And I think, uh, closing my remarks by again, uh, really acknowledging the fantastic contributions that our panelists made. Dr. Nabil Sharif, Ambassador Karimov, Professor Laurie Beeman, uh, Jean-Christophe Barr, and Lisa Anis, without forgetting, of course, Ambassador Yvonne uh, Baki, who uh, opened the symposium with her uh, observations. Please join me now in thanking our panelists for their tremendous contributions.